Hi everyone, Professor King here. <laughs> I don't know why I'm so happy because uh, we're talking about a novel that doesn't really deal in a lot of happiness so far or perhaps at all, we'll see. Um, if you're watching this video, you are watching uh, the introduction, the four, well, I'll say this, the foreword, uh, the uh, first part, all of winter, I believe, and a little teeny bit of autumn. No, that would be, that would be anachronistic. All of autumn and a teeny bit of winter uh, of The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. Uh, so I will be discussing those parts in relation to our course, our English 102 course, and what to look out for in terms of your discussion board. So this is a little more in depth. It's not gonna be super long, but it's a little more in depth than a typical web teach on the reading because we're essentially through with the literary terms that we've been doing since week one. And now we are uh, taking everything we've learned in the first three quarters of the semester and we're applying that to a reading of a novel. The novel again being The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison which may look like this. You might have a different uh, publication cover and that's totally fine because guess what? The words inside, exactly the same. Pages might just be different and that's okay. That's why I, I section things off on the syllabus by chapters instead of by pages. So that if you wanna be like me, cause I was a broke college student when I entered college at 17. And one of the reasons I became a literature major was because I could just go to the library and get books for free. Now they have the interwebs where you can do that too. Amazing, to quote Hulhauser. But if you wanna get your, long story short, if you wanna get your own copy that is either free or cheaper than this and the pagination is different, it's totally fine because again, in the syllabus, this is, our readings are, are, are sectioned off by chapter titles as opposed to page numbers. All you have to do is when you write your essay on this, make sure that you provide the, the publication information for your, your version, your publication version of this novel so that somebody who is reading your essay and then wants to do research into the novel can find it in that publication on that page you are referencing in MLA format, obviously. Anyway, uh, I'll take it to a share screen in just a moment. Before I do, I always like to remind everyone that if questions or concerns or comments arise, please always feel free to contact me, email, pronto, Zoom office hours, Canvas messaging, however works best for you. Uh, I, again, I can't do telepathy. I'm, my brain's functioning at not the highest level. So there, I'm nowhere near telepathy standards, but uh, any of those other ways that I mentioned you're good. So let's dive right in. Let's dive into the beginning of the bluest eye. I'm going to do my best. Well, first, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about uh, the discussion board so that you can anticipate what you want to think about or look for. And then when we get to uh, looking at the novel, you kind of know certain things you can home in on. And here's why I think it's a good idea to look at prompts, to look at uh, instructor-led questions before you start the reading. One, it gives you kind of an idea of perhaps themes or tones or uh, goings on, plot, characters, et cetera, within the novel so that you it's not just like wham, hitting you all at once. But also if you look at these lists and you go, oh, you know, I have a particular interest in critical race theory or in gender or in the notion of beauty or uh, mental health issues or any of these other things listed here. Then you can, again, kind of put your little bunny ears up, well, really your bunny eyes, I guess I would say, to look for these things uh, as you're reading the novel. Bunny fingers too, right? We don't want to, we don't want to exclude people who who read tactilely, that would be, that would be inappropriate of me. Uh, so the discussion board, which is gonna be due next week, uh, 
again, I'm filming this in the spring, so you may have a different discussion board due date, uh, but why make this video twice if I don't have to, right? Think smarter, not harder when you work. I always tell that to everyone. Anyway, the discussion board asks you to review the literary terms notes on plot direction, particularly as they pertain to exposition. If you'll recall, in an earlier literary terms video, I talked about exposition, right? In the, in the sort of uh, narrative plot direction or dramatic plot direction, exposition is usually the first thing that happens. And what exposition is, if, if you'll recall, is we are exposing the diegetic world of the, the play or the novel or the film or the short story to the reader. So we're, ex we're, we're presenting the characters, the setting, the rising action. Um, and if, if some of these terms are a little hazy or unfamiliar to you, go back and rewatch that very brief web teach on what exposition is. And once you've done that, look over this list and discuss why you think Morrison chose to begin the story, including the foreword, even though the foreword is nonfiction, meaning it's Morrison's own real world uh, sort of explication as to why she wrote the novel that she did in The Bluest Eye. Um, I still think it's important to consider that when we are diving into the narrative. Um, why she chose to begin this novel by presenting ideas related to one or more of the following from the list below. Or as she so, be I mean, gosh, do you just read her and just like, I mean, I read Toni Morrison and I'm just like, thanks a lot universe like thanks for giving me crummy genetics and like a really like mediocre sense of writing compared to her right she's she's a she's such a brilliant genius and if you ever read um she's got a great theoretical essay is it playing in the dark oh, it'll come to me anyway uh where she talks about sort of her rationale behind writing and and how again, deliberate and specific and like, like mind numbingly exacting she is with every single word she chooses in this, you know, almost over 200 page novel, like sh every single word in this thing, she is stressing over and pouring over. And one of the most interesting parts of the foreword is she's like, yeah, I didn't like the, <laughs> I didn't like the way I, I did this. I didn't like the actual outcome of it. And I, it, it bothers me to this day. Like she is such a writer, not only is she such a writer, but she's such a brilliant writer in that like, she stresses so much over every single word, just as we're supposed to do, except we're writing, you know, three page, five page, seven page essays. And this genius over here. And I mean that literally, this genius is writing a novel. Anyway, I'm very jealous of her talents and abilities, uh, as you can tell. Uh, but, oh well, I guess I'm really talented at making mediocre <laughs> YouTube videos. So I got that going for me. Anyway, I digress. Um, as she beautifully states herself, since why is difficult to handle, you may choose instead to quote, take refuge in how. Uh, and so here are some of the things that we're exposed to in the beginning of this novel. Clearly language, right? I just talked about how, how masterful she is, mistressful, if you wanna, you know, not be, uh, if you don't wanna be, you know, like, like gender loaded, I guess. Um, her approach to language, her emphasis on language, the kind of language she uses, the language she talks about using in the foreword, all of that, right? Uh, racism, beauty and ugliness, violence and war. And when I say violence and war, think about when and where this novel is taking place. And that might give you a little bit better context, context or a better hint, I guess I would say, to what war is going on. But that's not the only violence that's going on in this novel. There are many types of violence. So you may, may wanna focus on a different type of violence, but you know, maybe think about how war informs that. Uh, innocence and experience. 
love and hatred. And I hate to be so binaristic in these because really as you read the novel, as you start to go down this list, you'll realize that so many of these concepts are interchangeable, that they're intersectional, that they affect and are informed by one another. So if you wanna do you know, a couple, that's totally fine. Just try not to be a Jack or Jackie of all trades, meaning like don't try and do this whole list because then you're not gonna really say anything substantive. It's just gonna come off as kind of listy, right? Which is very superficial. And as writers, we do not wanna be superficial. We wanna be deep. Uh, depress depression, class and poverty, generational or cyclical historical patterns, uh, gender or anything else you might be noticing. Cause there's other stuff that again, I'm not noticing that you might. Um, and then the same as always, two to 300 words, post to some, respond to somebody else and quote the text, right? This is an MLA lit course. So we are emphasizing quoting uh, over summarizing quote the text to show that you've read one, but also to show that you have support for the claim you're making in this discussion board. All right, so we have an idea of what the discussion board is about. So now that we're thinking about that, now that now that our brains are kind of going, okay, there's some, these are some of the things that are gonna be going on in this novel. Now let's go to uh, the section specifically. And I've, I've sectioned this section, gosh, I'm, I'm just a wordsmith over here, old King the wordsmith, right? Uh, I've, I've blocked this off into the various sections that, that occur uh, in, this, in this beginning of the novel. So we start with the foreword. Again, the foreword is nonfiction and it's written by, well, all of this is written by Morrison herself, but this is actually Morrison kind of breaking that fourth wall, speaking to you, the reader, saying, here's why I wrote this thing. So things to think about as you're reading the foreword that you, that you wanna keep in mind while you're reading. When was the novel published? She alludes to it in the foreword. You can look at the exact date uh, on the publication page, which is usually about, let's see, two or three pages in, gives you all that publication information and then more in more depth uh, there. So think about when it was written. Uh, when it's published versus when it takes place. Think about what Morrison says her reason for writing it was. What's the purpose? What sort of catalyzed the idea for her as a writer or anything else you read that you think is important? Think about what she says she's trying to convey. Remember that discussion of dominant impression we had earlier on in the semester or how all texts essentially create an argument. What's the dominant impression or maybe the implied argument with this novel that she is at least on the road to making. We don't know the full argument or the full dominant impression because we're not at the end of the novel yet, but you might get glimpses here and there in the beginning especially in this forward. Um, and then I think a really good idea is when we do finish the novel, go back, cause this forward's only like three or four pages, go back and read it again because she mentions characters that you don't know yet. She mentions instances that you don't know yet. So then once you've read the novel and you have the full picture, it's not a bad idea to go back to this forward and reread it or just skim it and, and go, oh, okay, okay, I, I'm seeing that, right? Or, okay whatever. All right, then the next section, and this is what's going, this is the section that is essentially responsible for all of these chapter titles that we're going to see throughout the novel. Um, it's the section, it doesn't have a title itself, but it seems to be excerpted, if you will, from like a children's book or something. Uh, and it starts out the first sentence is here is the house. And then it goes on and on and on. So the first thing I would say is like, what is this? Beyond just like an excerpt from a children's book. Why is it there before we even know any of the action taking place? And again, you may have to read a little bit and then go back and go, what the heck is this, right? Like, why is this here before we get any narration? Why'd she put this here? 
why is this uh why is this part of the title of every section and why is it written in the way it is really think about all of that then we go uh into autumn and, and at, at the end of this section i made you read a little bit of the beginning of winter but mostly uh all all of these bullet points here take place in autumn at the end right some in winter but just keep that in mind so we're introduced to claudia who is our first narrator we're also introduced to frida claudia's sister <clears throat> They discuss their family and neighbors. They discuss their home. They talk about uh, some experiences that they have. So again, the great thing about a story is you learn so much more about a character or a scene or a situation or a place or a time by this, uh, by the descriptive details, by the story, by the nar narrative itself, than if someone were to just say, this is X, right? That, that would make for an interesting story, right? Like I could, I could tell you that my dog Lionel, who's sitting right over here, uh, you know, I could say like Lionel is a mischievous dog and you go, great, right? It's, I get it, but it doesn't really say anything to me. Or I could tell you a story about how one of Lionel's favorite things to do is the moment I take off my socks, and I set them absentmindedly somewhere within his grasp, like on the couch or even on the floor. I know I shouldn't, I'm, you know, I live alone, give me a break. But let's say I do that. I leave my socks on the floor, I leave them on the couch. What Lionel likes to do, all 70 pound basset hound stinky breath of him, is he likes to grab those socks and do one of two things. One, he's, he immediately starts chewing on them and you know, leaves a lovely little hole in a plethora of socks I've owned over the seven years that he's been in my life. Or he runs away and he runs away and he looks at me with these, you know, very playful eyes. And he expects me to chase after him. And the reason why he expects me to chase after him is if I chase after him, he keeps running. But he doesn't run fast. It's a little like he's a he's a basset hound, so he almost looks like a, I call him a, a pony rabbit because he looks like a blend of a pony and a bunny, and he runs away, kind of trots away, and he expects me to chase after him because he knows that the only way I can get my sock back from him is if I have a little treat. Then he'll drop the sock, he'll eat the treat, and then I can grab the sock while he's chewing on the treat. That's my dog Lionel in a nutshell. So again, think about this. If I just said, Lionel is a mischievous dog, you can't really see Lionel. You can't really clearly understand his personality. You don't see me being the ridiculous dog owner that I am and playing into this one. I know I shouldn't, but you know, that's, a, that's a discussion for another day. You don't see any of those things. You don't see the argument that I'm trying to make, but when you see him grabbing my sock and me chasing after him and him waiting for that, for that tree and him knowing he's going to get it with a little smirk on his face, you get such a clearer picture of that argument that I'm making. than if I would, would have just said, he's a mischievous dog, right? So in a nutshell, that's why people write fiction is because they want to show you, they want to, they want to create this world for you which is very kind and lovely of them, by the way, to do that because it takes a lot of work. But they wanna create this world for you so that they can have a conversation with you. So that you as the reader then make your own argument about the story they're telling, right? You, can, you could have just listened to that story I told you about Lionel and you could have thought, oh, that's adorable. What a cute dog. But you also could have thought, what a dummy. Why does she always give her dog snacks? Like you're playing into bad behavior. Or you could have thought, who cares? Why does Professor King always talk about dogs? I like cats or salamanders or whatever, right? And that is going to initiate such a richer conversation between author and reader, between reader and reader, 
between theorist and author, between all the people who have been talking about these issues for millennia, than to just say, he's a mischievous dog, right? So that's why. Anyway, let's go back to this. Um, so thinking about Claudia, Frida, their family and neighbors, their home, why, again, always think about why is Morrison creating this world, painstakingly focusing on every single word as she does so, every aspect of a character, every detail, what does she want us to see? What does she want us to think about? What conversation is she trying to have with us? Think about the setting, right? Again, when and where this novel takes place, compare that to when and where, well, maybe not where it was written, but when it was written and what might be noteworthy about that. If I, you know, if I, as Professor King in 2021 is writing about, you know, I'm writing a novel that takes place in the seventies, why would I do that? If, if Toni Morrison is writing in a certain time period, but she's reflecting on another time, why is she doing that? Especially given the characters where it takes place, et cetera, et cetera. All right, then we meet the Breed Loves. Interesting name, maybe think about what that means, Breed Love. We have Charlie, we have Pecola, we have Mrs. Breed Love, we have Sammy. Think about their lives. Think about how they are described as characters, both, both physically and in terms of personality and behavior. Think about their situation. What are their lives like? Um, you know, what is this whole thing about being out of doors? That, I mean, I've read this novel, you know, a bunch of times because I've taught it a bunch of times. And I always come back to that phrase out of doors, but there are so many other phrases, the furniture, uh, you know, think about that. Think about what Piccola cares about, what her interests are versus what her situation is, what, who she is, what she loves, what she cares about, um, her personality, everybody's personality in this novel, but particularly this family's. Because, you know, this Piccola is our, is our central character. She may not be our narrator at all times. You know, right now, Claudia is the narrator, but she she is the, the, the person who we are starting to realize like, oh, we need to focus on her. So if we need to focus on her, we probably need to maybe understand her family a little bit better too. Um, then we meet some sex workers. Uh, in the novel, they're called whores uh, because that would be the language of the time that that uh, reflected that time period. Uh, so I, you know, just as a 2021 kind of more sensitive to people in, the, in those professions, right? Just put the, the phrase sex worker, uh, but, but our narrator does refer to them as whores. So just keep that in mind. Think about the, the, those characters, how they're described, et cetera, et cetera. We've got Meringue Pie, who is another character. This is starting to go into uh, the winter section uh, at this point, we have Mr. Henry, who was who was originally mentioned in Autumn, but we start to see more of Mr. Henry in this section. And maybe like thinking about how he's presented in Autumn versus how he's presented in Winter uh, might be some food for thought. And then finally, setting physical and historical setting are important, but emotional landscape is equally often, if not more important. And when I say the emotional landscape of the novel, I'm talking about how characters feel, how they behave based on their feelings. Cause that's, I mean, that's, that is a fictionalized understanding of human nature, right? We all behave certain ways based on how we feel. And if you haven't <laughs> sat with that at some point during COVID, I don't know what to tell you, right? We've all sat with this, like, why am I feeling this? Why am I doing this? And now we can do the exact same thing, but instead of navel gazing on ourselves, we look at the characters in the novel. Why do they feel this way? What are they feeling? How are they behaving based on these feelings? This, this sense of self, this sense of others, this sense of the world, who are what's making them feel this way, right? Um, 
think about all of those things because again this emotional landscape the landscape of the novel is going to be equally if not more important than the physical landscape so i hope that helps i'll take it off stop share now i hope that helps for this first section i hope i didn't blah 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 belabor points too much but you know me the answer to that is yes i did uh Again, if you have questions or comments or concerns, please feel free to message me in any of the ways that I always bring up, Canvas, Pronto, email, Zoom office hours, et cetera. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day and week, and I will see you in cyberspace. Goodbye.